Garbage would emerge out of the 90s, blending together techno, shoegazing, power pop, grunge, and post-punk. But by the early to mid-2000s, the band was barely hanging on by a thread. Today, let's explore the history of the band Garbage. The history of Garbage really began several decades prior to the formation of the band. Since frontwoman Shirley Manson was a lot younger than the rest of the members, the men in Garbage had already had a long history in the music industry, seeing both the highs and the lows. Drummer Butch Vig and multi-instrumentalist Duke Erickson grew up in small-town America. Vig hailed from Viroqua, Wisconsin, and was the son of a Norwegian doctor. Vig originally spent six years studying piano before switching over to the drums, and at a young age he begged his parents to join the Columbia House Music Club so he could get his hands on a Grand Funk Railroad record. Erickson, meanwhile, grew up in Lyons, Nebraska, a town of no more than a thousand people, a place where Erickson would venture out to the local appliance store to buy records. To both men, the pop music they heard on the radio in their youth seemed to come from a foreign planet, given that they lived in pretty isolated places. It would be ironic that years later, they would be played on that same radio. One of Vig's earliest musical memories was witnessing a Steppenwolf concert, which inspired the same type of energy he wanted to replicate with Garbage's live shows. The city of Madison, Wisconsin also played an important role in Garbage's history. In the 70s, it was part of a thriving music scene that saw a new wave in American and British punk rock groups playing at a local legendary club named Maryland. Madison was also the birthplace of one of the city's most iconic bands named Spooner, who formed in 1974 by Duke Erickson. Erickson would front the band while also playing guitar, and he initially had planned on becoming an art teacher, but music soon became his calling. It was during this time Butch Vig was studying at the University of Wisconsin, specializing in film direction. Both men had apparently met each other at the University of Wisconsin, and by 1978 Vig was planning on moving to Colorado to become a ski instructor, but Erickson convinced Vig to stay in Madison and join Spooner as the band's drummer, something he agreed to do. Vig would bring along another film student named Steve Marker, who would join the band as their roadie. Spooner would end up having some success in the Midwest, releasing two well-received albums and opening for the likes of Pat Benatar, Cheap Trick, and The Police. Spooner would eventually fall apart with the trio regrouping in the same roles to form the follow-up group Firetown. But like a lot of musicians, the trio grew frustrated. Firetown released their first album for $5,000, had a modest hit with the single Carrying a Torch, and even had some exposure on MTV with Vig recalling to the Morning Call newspaper. All of a sudden, all the major labels came after us. We ended up signing and doing a huge budget record in New York and touring, but then everything just kind of fell apart. I mean, the classic things that happen to you. Your management breaks up, your tour support is pulled, your bass player quits the band. All the disasters that happened to so many bands happened to us. It kind of left a bitter taste in my mouth, he'd say. It was this experience that convinced Vig that he never wanted to play in a band again or go on tour. Marker and Vig started getting more involved in music production, investing in a four-track recorder. Marker and Vig even opened up their own studio in Madison in the mid-80s called Smart Studios. Soon enough, Vig's production career started to take off. He would work with local Madison act Killdozer and land work from one of America's biggest indie labels at the time, Chicago-based Touch & Go Records. His success as a producer didn't happen overnight. He would produce hundreds of bands telling the morning call, I did polka bands and opera singer, I produced jazz and country bands and heavy metal bands. By the mid 90s, Vig started producing more high profile acts including Nirvana, The Smashing Pumpkins and Sonic Youth. Despite his massive success as a producer, Vig would admit to the morning call that he didn't want to be typecast saying, I didn't want to be known as well, he's a grunge producer. It was during the same time period that Vig, Marker and Erickson would lay the foundation for what would become garbage. The trio would begin taking the music of U2 and Nine Inch Nails, keeping the vocal tracks but erasing all the instrumentals and recording their own music. Vig would tell the Washington Post, that's what got me back into it. When we do remixes, we erase everything and basically rewrite the songs. And for the first time in about four or five years, I was writing and playing again. I'm a sucker for a pop song and a great hook. I'm really a pop geek. We wanted to write melodic pop songs and have a lot of guitar hooks, but also experiment and put in all kinds of crazy noises, distort the drums, or cut them up, run it backwards, whatever he'd say. Vig and company had an idea that this new project would remain as a studio act with a revolving group of vocalists. The three men agreed that the first singer they wanted to work with should be a female, 
And it was by strange coincidence that Marker and Vig were watching MTV one night when they saw a band named Angelfish performing the song Suffocate Me. Fronting the group was a sultry young woman named Shirley Manson. Vig recalled to Yahoo, we were all struck by it. I think the thing that really drew us into the song and to Shirley was she was singing really low and understated at the time. A lot of the bands on 120 Minutes or sort of the alternative music scene that was breaking were full on roar. We just thought that Shirley was kind of doing the opposite of what a lot of singers were doing at the time. Within 24 hours, the trio were able to get in touch with Angel Fish's label, who passed on Shirley's management information to them, and soon enough a meeting was set up with her at a hotel in London. Manson, for her part, hailed from Edinburgh, Scotland. Her mother was a big influence on her, performing in big bands, while her father was a geneticist. Manson would soon become fans of groups like The Pretenders and Susie and the Banshees. A gifted child, she would take up music at a young age, playing piano, violin, clarinet, and even attend a theater camp. Despite her talents, she was always very hard on herself as a child, hating her and I quote, pugly ugly looks, while her sisters were lavished with much more attention and praise. Manson rebelled telling Spin Magazine, I was unhappy at school and wanted to be bad, so I became insular and started playing Susie and the Banshees and screaming really loud, I hate you, I hate you. I started wearing my dad's clothes all the time and hiding behind black eye makeup. It was just not a nice time. My mom lost her singing voice because she was so angry with me, because she got so upset with my delinquency. Despite rebelling against her parents, she had a pretty solid family, relatively speaking. She would grow up in the neighborhood of Stockbridge, which was full of broken hippie homes telling Spin, I really should have had no complaints about my upbringing, considering that all my friends were from these broken hippie homes. We were pot smoking early because my mom's friends gave us joints. My friend's mother was a prostitute. Another friend's mom was addicted to alcohol and antidepressants. My eyes were opened up quite early, she'd say. Madsen would end up leaving school at the age of 15, working at a clothing store, and start hooking up with boys, and going to nightclubs dancing the weekend away. By the age of 17 in 1984, she would join her first band, the post-punk outfit Goodbye Mr. McKenzie, as a backup singer. It was during this time she got into a tumultuous relationship with the group's frontman, Martin Metcalf, telling Louder Sound, I felt so plain and normal, and like such an incredible fraud for really not doing much in the band. I was also involved with a man who lived a pretty wild and extreme existence, so there was a lot of madness in excess. I just longed for a bohemian lifestyle. I would go out to clubs every night and dance myself stupid. That felt like freedom, she'd say. Goodbye Mr. McKenzie had a little taste of success, having a single called The Rattler that charted in the UK, peaking in number 37 in the spring of 1989. Manson's relationship with Metcalf would fall apart, and she eventually left the group. She would soon find herself playing with the outfit Angelfish, who nabbed a recording contract with Radioactive Records. The group only released one album and did a brief tour before she would end up joining Garbage. Now let's go back to that meeting between the men in Garbage and Manson. Within 24 hours of witnessing Manson's performance on MTV, the men were able to contact her record label, who passed on her information to them. Soon enough, a meeting was arranged in London at a hotel, while it seemed like a big break for Manson, she initially wasn't sold on the idea, given that the men were significantly older than her and already had connections to the music industry telling the LA Times, I come from a background of what I call working bands. This means we basically travel doing crummy gigs. There's a certain snobbishness that exists among bands like that where producer becomes an ugly word. So when I joined the band, my attitude toward the other members was, you don't know everything. Once I started to work with them though, I quickly realized that not only were they musicians with a profound knowledge of the studio, but they were also passionate about what they wanted to do musically, even persnickety about what sounds they wanted to make, she'd say. Arrangements would be made for Madsen to come to Madison to rehearse with the group. She would tell Yahoo about the chance she took auditioning for the band, saying, You know, traveling from Scotland to Madison with no money in my pocket, no way of really getting home, no way of touching base, I wouldn't recommend that for anyone, but I was lucky they weren't creeps. They could have easily been creeps, and at least one of them could have been a weirdo, but they were really great. The audition process didn't really go well. Ericsson would tell Louder Sound, we couldn't get into Smart Studios because it was full, so we had to set up a makeshift studio in the basement of Steve's house. We ran a mic cable upstairs to the lounge where Shirley sat all by herself. It was a bleak couple days in winter. I'd go up and check on her now and again, and she would be staring out the window. It was during this time that Manson was staying in a hotel in Madison, with Vig admitting to Yahoo it was a scene similar to the movie The Shining, with Shirley being the only person staying in that particular wing of the hotel. Manson, for her part, lied to the band, claiming that she was a songwriter, even though she wasn't. 
admitting to Yahoo. They said, okay, we're going to play some music and you're going to just come see what you come up with, see what comes up off the top of your head. And I had never done any writing in my life up until this point, but I had lied to them saying, yes, I was a writer because I thought if I was honest and said I didn't write, I wouldn't get a chance of auditioning. I think they were like, oh God, who's this loser? And I went home and their management called me up the next day and said, I hear the audition didn't go so well yesterday. And I was like, yeah, it was terrible. But I feel like maybe if we had another go, it might be better. Thankfully, Manson's future bandmates felt the same way. She would end up returning home with some of the demos she had worked on during her time in Wisconsin, and this is where things really took a turn for the better. She soon started writing lyrics for the songs Only Happy When It Rains and Vow, and when the men got in touch with her to audition again, there was finally a sense of direction to the band's sound. The men in Garbage buried their plans to have a revolving cast of singers, but their initial plans to remain a studio act weren't fully abandoned yet. Manson would admit to the Washington Post, touring is very intimate and closely formed activity and I was frightened of going near a stage with three people I didn't know. I remember saying, I'm not playing with you guys live. But the band would change their tune on touring after filming the video for Vow. That music video represented the first time the band performed live together. While Manson may have felt insecure in her new band, Vig reinforced just how important she was to the group telling Spin, you know if we hadn't met Shirley there quite possibly wouldn't be any garbage. We wouldn't have put a record out and we would have gone back to producing. Shirley really helped give us more context. It was also another characteristic of Shirley that made her fit in with the group, and that was her honesty and outspokenness. So where did the name Garbage come from? Well, a friend would hear an early rehearsal and said that the band sounded like Garbage. Vig would tell the Chicago Tribune, he kept laughing and chanting Garbage, 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 and I told him we're going to turn that garbage into a song, and thus the band's name was born. The group's debut album featured some songs containing as many as 120 tracks, and Shirley would recall to the LA Times how far along some of those songs were when she joined the group saying, by the time I joined the band, they had these little sketches of songs but nothing was finished. Some of the ideas for lyrics I found unsuitable and others I liked and worked on them. I always went to bat for what I believed in, she'd say. The album's themes dealt with obsession, voyeurism, hedonism, and self-destruction. The group would land a recording contract with boutique label Almo Records, which was distributed through Geffen. The label signed the group after A&R man Bob Bortnick discovered the group. The band was soon the subject of a bidding war between different labels, with Bortnick telling Billboard magazine, they were the best sounding demos I ever heard. I was really knocked out, but I didn't say anything. Bortnick, who was new at the label, only having worked there several weeks, was careful not to push his ideas. But luckily for him, the band enjoyed the idea of working with a new label and signed with Almo. When Bortnick met the band for the first time in Madison, they sent a garbage truck to pick him up from the airport. Ahead of the band's debut album dropping, there was a lot of self-doubt about this new project. Vig would tell the Washington Post, I was terrified particularly because no one knew who we were. They knew who I was, and if we went out and sucked live, no one would remember Duke, Steve, and Shirley. It would have been me because I had the highest profile at the time. Vig would also admit in other interviews that those close to him told him not to do the band thing. The group's self-titled album was released in August of 1995, and it barely cracked the Billboard 200, charting at number 193. Their success in America happened really accidentally. The track Vow was licensed to a UK magazine and CD sampler publication named Volume in late 1994. It was subsequently picked up by BBC Radio 1's DJ Steve Lamack and John Peel, who played it on their show in December of 1994. The first stations to embrace the band in America was Seattle's KNDD and KROQ or K-Rock in Los Angeles, and both stations' program directors stumbled across the band's promotional single in that copy of Volume magazine. Vow was already hitting the airwaves in America in May of 1995, several months ahead of the album's release, and the label was taken aback at the reception and wasn't really prepared for it. This would result in Vow not really getting the proper promotion it deserved, despite that the song still peaked at number 97 on the Billboard Hot 100 charts. There were talks of re-releasing the single down the road, but the label opted to put out a different song from the record. As the band focused on hitting the road to support the album, they ran into a problem. How would they replicate the studio recordings in the live setting? Vig would recall to the Washington Post, We realized pretty quickly that we couldn't do that. Once we started freeing ourselves up from having to translate the songs that way, we started speeding them up and changing keys, doing different intros and outros, started ad-libbing things he'd say. Helped by a string of highly successful singles including Vow, Only Happy When It Rains, Queer and Stupid Girl, and coupled with the outtake called Number One Crush appearing on the multi-platinum Romeo and Juliet soundtrack, 
In addition to a grueling 18-month tour, the band's self-titled debut record moved several million copies in America. Manson's bandmates soon took a backseat to their singer, whose honesty and personal appearance attracted a lot of attention. Hailed as a sex symbol, Glamour magazine would identify her as, and I quote, the poster girl for Rock's new Glamour. While she would wear various designers and sell her own makeup on the band's website, companies including teen fashion house Contemporary Casuals would even hire a model bearing some resemblance to Shirley in their marketing campaign. A spokesperson for the company at the time would say, Shirley is definitely an icon that young girls can say now, there's somebody I can relate to and look up to. She's got an edgy kind of bare bones cool essence that isn't overpackaged. Three years later, the band returned with their highly anticipated follow-up version 2.0. As the software-like title suggested, it was meant to be more of an improvement over what worked. Manson wrote virtually all the lyrics on the album, resulting in a much more personal, direct, and revealing record than his predecessor. Vig would reveal to The Morning Call, We thought it would be a mistake to reinvent ourselves. We felt we really kind of carved out our turf and established our identity. That's really important these days because so many bands have one hit and then they disappear. We wanted to take everything we did on the first record and make it better. The album was another success going platinum, spawning the singles I Think I'm Paranoid and Push It. By the way, who remembers playing NHL 2000 on the PC back in the day? But expectations, self-esteem issues, and just the craziness of being thrust into the public spotlight weighed heavily on the members of the band. With Marker recalling to louder sound, we didn't realize how crazy it all was. Flying into Europe from America on a private plane for one night to play at the MTV Awards and having Mick Jagger walk into our dressing room to say hi. It was all going so fast and that mixed with our bizarre self-esteem issues, always thinking we had effed everything up, didn't allow us to see the big picture he'd say. Meanwhile, Shirley Manson would add, I was thrilled by our success but embarrassed about it too. It was as if it meant that in some way we must suck. I also felt like I had to be something I wasn't. I would freak out if I hadn't had a manicure, like I wasn't being a good pop star. I felt though everybody was disappointed when they met me in real life because I was aware I was working with incredible image makers and that I didn't look like that. Mad, twisted, sick thinking, and it made me ill in the end, she'd say. Three years later in September of 2001, Garbage released their third record, Beautiful Garbage. The material was mostly written on the version 2.0 tour, and Manson would chronicle the progress of the album online in numerous blog posts, becoming one of the first big rock stars to do this. One year prior, the band would deal with numerous business issues as their label Alamo Records would fold after Universal Music Group purchased them, resulting in a prolonged legal battle with Universal. A lawsuit garbage filed against Universal Music Group claimed that the company is, and I quote, effectively holding singer Shirley Manson as ransom by threatening to uphold stipulations in a contract she had signed in her previous band Angel Fish, which was signed to Radioactive Records, which was now owned by Universal Music Group. Stipulations the suit claimed had been ignored since Garbage came to fame in 1994. Manson would tell Louder Sound, We brought out our third record, and we were due to promote it the day before the September 11th attacks, and then the whole world changed. And we were plunged into decades of, for the most part, sugary pop. All of a sudden, we were an old-fashioned band that nobody wanted to hear from. Our record company were furious because they wanted to make money, so they wanted us to change our sound, and they wanted us to compromise. We were not prepared to do that. To counter the demands of the label of molding her into a pop star, Manson would cut her hair short and dye it blonde. During the tour, drummer Butch Vig would be diagnosed with Hepatitis A, followed by Bell's palsy, resulting in the group bringing in a few replacement drummers. In addition to that, Manson was going through an ugly divorce with her first husband, Eddie Farrell, claiming in the same interview, at that point I was a basket case. It was an incredibly painful divorce and it sent me off the rails. I just felt very scared and panicked in the world, not able to trust anyone, so nobody, not even the band, knew what I was going through, she'd say. The band's fourth album, Bleed Like Me, almost never came out, as the group's chemistry seemed to be disappearing. Released in the spring of 2005, the band called it quits six months later, went on tour, tensions within the group, and with their record label came to a head. Vig would tell Louder Sound, I remember feeling an unbelievable sense of exhilaration when we finally decided to quit the tour. It had been 10 years and we were worn out and sick of each other. Manson would add in the same interview, we were barely even speaking. We didn't want to talk to anyone outside of the band about the problems we were having with our career. So of course it turned into this whole passive aggressive thing between us. I just wanted to get the F out of here and go home. During their time off, the men in Garbage went back to producing while Manson worked on a solo record, collaborated with other artists, and appeared on the TV show Terminator The Sarah Connor Chronicles. The band members would reconvene in 2010 due to personal tragedies. 
Manson's mom would pass away due to dementia in 2008, while the following year mutual friends of Manson and Vig dealt with the death of one of their children from cancer. Manson and Vig would see each other at the funeral and talk things over, and jam sessions with the other members of Garbage would soon be initiated. The band would release three more albums since their reunion, including 2012's Not Your Kind of People, 2016's Strange Little Birds, and this year's No Gods, No Masters. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again on Rock and Roll True Stories. Take care.